Hi everyone, Sean here with Take Charge of Change. We have a really special podcast interview today with Ron Overland. Ron's story is compelling and interesting because he had a really big goal. In fact, even at the start of that goal, I think Ron probably had moments where he thought, this is just so impossible. But Ron's goal was to reclaim his health, and as part of that goal, um, he lost 100 pounds. Um, and not only did he lose 100 pounds and reclaim his health, but he also, over that two-year period, went from being basically a couch potato to becoming a very competitive age group triathlete. And in fact, he qualified for Canada's world's team uh, on two occasions to compete in the World Triathlon Championships. Um, now, Ron's story was about reclaiming his health, and one of the byproducts of that was to lose his weight. Um, but when you listen to the podcast, there's a lot of wisdom and tips and strategies that Ron used that all of us could take advantage of. So if you're struggling with your health, with your weight, or maybe other goals that you're trying to accomplish, uh, then I'd encourage you to listen to the podcast. I think you'll get some good value from it. So enjoy the podcast. It's a real pleasure to have Ron Oberlin uh, join us today for this podcast uh, edition that we're putting out for Take Charge of Change. And Ron has a just a really amazing story to share uh, that involves losing over 100 pounds. And although that was an incredible story, uh, there's a lot of lessons that come out of uh, Ron's journey. He went from an inactive lifestyle to becoming a competitive age group triathlete. And he's qualified on two occasions for the Canadian triathlon team that competes at the World Championships. So it's been quite a transition or transformation for him. And what is even more amazing is that that transition uh, took, cha took place over a two-year period. So a lot happened over a very short period of time. So, Ron, thanks so much for uh, joining us for this podcast. You're welcome. You know, your story is, like I said, is inspiring. And um, I think anyone that's sort of gone down the journey of trying to improve their health uh, or is at a point that they they want to try to take some uh, some initiative and make some changes uh, your story I think is very instructive um, but did the change that that you initiated in your life uh, take place gradually over time was it something that just kind of over time it dawned on you that geez I just I just do need to to make a change here or was there a particular moment or a tipping point um, you know, that proverbial straw that broke the camel's back that caused you to embark on this change or this transformation? Yeah, you know, Sean, that's a, a great question. There was a point when I was at my maximum weight of 283 pounds uh, when I was bending over to tie my shoes, and I actually had to take in a breath and, like, and to pull my stomach in as tight as I could go just to do that. And that, that's the exact point in time when I said, this needs to end now, and that really was my defining moment. Wow. So were there, were, there, were there times leading up to that, that that you thought about a little bit, or was it literally there just this epiphany? It just, this has to change. Well, I knew that um, my weight was beginning to rise, and uh, um, I was concerned, too, that I was predisposed to a chronic condition. Yeah. My, my grandfather and father both died in their 50s, and here I was in my late 30s, nearly 100 pounds overweight, working long hours, not exercising, and really not eating well. And I and I, I recognized I just had a complete lack of work-life balance. So my wife and I, like both of our times, uh, were spent driving the kids to their lessons, their sporting activities, and really like sitting there watching them while they swam their laps or practiced their goal kicks or mm. yeah, piano. So for me, I think we were, were, for me, like I was helping the kids to be more balanced, but I had completely yeah. expected to consider what I was doing to myself. So just, I guess, from that, um, my goal, I think, really became to achieve an overall balance in my life with some of the activities, like not only losing weight, which was great, but moderating my work hours, achieving like achieving healthier eating and sleeping habits. I wanted to just plan some fun activities, like for my marriage and family time. Okay. So a more, yeah, a more balanced perspective overall. Okay. So it was, you know, I, I think we you did talk about the fact that the weight loss was almost an unintended benefit, but it, there was, it wasn't just about losing weight. It was about looking at different aspects of your life, your family time, your work-life balance, like you said, and obviously the nutritional piece was a piece of it, but it wasn't the only piece. No, the, you're absolutely correct. The, that I was able to achieve the weight loss along with these other goals was just an added bonus. Hmm. Obviously, it's, it's paid off too, but, but um, um, it was uh, not, not the main focus really. Wow. Now, you know, very often uh, issues or potential problems in life, you know, have a way of creeping up on us slowly. Sometimes there's warning signs, but we're just not attentive or in tune uh, to them. And one reason is 
we as humans we often have a great ability to rationalize away issues in our life and eventually these issues can become large enough to cry out for attention. You mentioned that you had come from a physically active background. Um, I think you're involved in sports and athletics and yet you found yourself in a physical state that at one point you would have probably thought would be impossible um, to have happened to you. Uh, can you share a little bit about your athletic background and your thoughts about how you were able to maybe rationalize away the reality of your unhealthy lifestyle and, and the events taking place in your life that helped to conspire against uh, health? Well, certainly, Sean. You know, I was very athletic in multiple sports during my youth. I was not a child who sat around at all. Um, right up until I got married in my mid-20s, I was involved in team sports to the point that I was even invited by universities to attend their training camps. But oh, okay. Like, that was in basketball, but I also enjoyed cycling, hiking, and, and canoeing, too. Yeah. You know, but after getting married, though, you know, my wife and I, we bought our home. We had two wonderful children. We both returned to graduate school. Then we both settled into a very sedentary lifestyle. Mm. Um, I moved into a management job at work. I started taking my laptop to the pool so I could work for the three hours each day that my son was swimming. You know, and it just crept up over the course of about 10 or 12 years. My work began to take a higher priority, and the weight began to pack on as a result, too. When we talk about background, like I didn't ever really see myself as overweight or unfit. I always thought there would really be no problem to get back into shape. As mm -hmm. it was, I guess, historically an athlete. Yeah. Um, I just kind of considered myself between between athletic pursuits, really. So okay. I kind of thought, like, that's kind of how I rationalized it. I was in shape, but just a little heavy because I wasn't involved in activities. That's really kind of how my mindset was. Okay. But at the same time, really, I didn't know that I really had the time to take care of myself either. So. But it was only when I started realizing, you know, my pants had moved to 42-inch waist and they were getting snug on me even at that point. I couldn't run when playing with the kids outside. My resting heart rate was at 75 beats per minute. And my my weight was just continuing to increase. And I was 100 pounds overweight, than it, or 100 pounds more than I was on the day I got married. Um, I thought, this is crazy. So even one year, I even bowed out of this annual hiking trip I've been doing for 14 years straight. It's a 65-kilometer trail with my lifelong friends, but I was actually backed up because I was concerned I might have a heart attack. Hmm. And I think canceling on that trip really bothered me. It really, hmm. really bothered me. You, you know, it's you, you talk about um, all the activities with your kids, how you're focused on, you know, helping them with their balance and different aspects of your life. And it, it's so true that as parents, um, there's just a, not a lot of, you know, buffer time. And it's and, and so hard sometimes for folks to um, justify you know, exercising or building those other things into into their life because they don't think they have the margin to do it. You know, I, I think that probably, and you might be able to shed some light on this, but when it comes to work-life balance, we, we live in a world where, you know, we, we feel like we have to put in more time and work harder um, because of the competitive pressures of the work environment. And yet, ironically, and, and maybe you found this, is that actually by striking that balance, you had more energy so that when you actually were at work, you probably were you, did you find yourself increasingly more productive? That even though you might have... Yeah, I certainly was not less productive. And I think in many ways I was more productive. Yeah. In fact, I could walk into a room and be be feeling very motivated. People, had, and knowing that I had inspired some other people too, it just kind of gives you a little bit of extra power, a little bit of extra energy, and kind of feeling of wanting to do well. Um, but if we I think we talked a little about the, the kids' structure. Like, the structure for me was really important to getting, getting myself moving too. So I tried to take advantage of the structure of my son's activities. Really, my wife dealt with her daughter's things. I was more involved in my son's things. So trying to leverage some of that time. Um, I, my, he was in the water 21 hours a week with a swim team. Oh, wow. So he was, that's a lot of swimming. It is, yeah, for, for, a young, for a young man it is, or a young boy. Yeah. Um, but I recognize I have a lot of time to kill there. Um, but at the same time, that means a lot, there's a lot less time for excuses. Because there wasn't really yeah. I couldn't fit even a small workout into my schedule. So, so instead of sitting there watching him, I just purchased a facility pass and began planning for my own my own physical activity during that same time that he was in the pool. And really, with my weight the way it was, it started with walking on a treadmill and riding an exercise bike, and certainly not for the full 21 hours either, but at least once a day, yeah. um, maybe for an hour or two at the most. Um, but eventually I started set, setting aside other times for phys physical activity too, and even clean during my lunch hour. Okay. Work, I stopped working, sitting at my desk, and got up, got out, uh, started swimming each day um, at a nearby pool instead. And just what an absolute difference it's made. 
And I, th I think that probably one of the key points that will come out of this discussion today is the absolute importance of structure, just kind of building into the regular routines um, you know, of your day, of your week. And uh, I think once, once folks are able to do that and kind of carve out those times, and it, it sounds like it doesn't have to be a lot of time. Like it sounds like you, you had little bits and pieces through the week that you did consistently, but it was just part of the normal routines. And it doesn't sound like it was incredibly disruptful. Uh, to what you were doing as as a family, so it really speaks to the importance of structure, but the fact that it's not impossible. I mean, it it, it can be integrated into your day to day. Exactly. It's just a matter of making the focused effort to uh, to find that time. Exactly. So we've got basically the the previous point was sort of um, this notion that. Uh, less is more in some ways, that by striking that balance you can actually bring more energy and, um, and fresh energy to your family or to your work. Um, and so that's an important point. Structure, um, absolutely critical to build structure into your, your days and your weeks that's consistent, predictable, that uh, takes into account the other competing priorities, obviously, of work and family. Um, what about the notion of accountability? You know, often accountability can be a, a, a really critical factor in successful goal achievement. Did you have any specific strategies in place to keep you accountable to yourself or to others in your pursuit of a healthy lifestyle? Yeah, I, I did actually. Um, it's amazing, it, or it's interesting. It changed throughout throughout the course of my of my personal transformation. Like in the beginning, I, I looked at a few of the online tracking programs, but nothing really took hold of me. Um, I understand there are also like mobile apps, but I'm okay. able to achieve their weight loss goals or other lifestyle goals, but I haven't used any of those. I'm not really into technology perhaps as, as much as uh, I should be or the way others are. You know, and I also wonder sometimes if my wife and friends grew weary of my regular updates on my progress. But mm -hmm. it's interesting around accountability. There's accountability. There's one person at my work who was a former competitive athlete, and she really understood my drive, and she always wanted me to center the details on my workouts and my okay. towards the goals. So she's almost like my unofficial coach. It's interesting how I, <laughs> she really helped for me to develop a mindset. But That's so neat. It, so initially, there's like that external force, but then as my physical abilities improved, I started really becoming more accountable to myself. I started studying my small goals and then working very hard to reach them. In the workout room of the pool, the shortest amount of time, for example, Sean, is that you could program the TED treadmill to run was six minutes. That's the absolute shortest it would go. Okay. That my goal, just to go to be able to run for, for six minutes. I still remember the very first time that I ran the entire six minutes. I always joke I felt like Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic. I was king of the treadmill. So that was a really an incredible moment for me. I, it's so vivid in my mind. Wow. So you literally went from, over that two-year journey, you went from having a goal of six minutes in the treadmill to qualifying a couple of times for the world's team for triathlon. That's correct. Wow. Okay. So that puts it in perspective. That's that's yeah. amazing. Okay. It, it, but it wasn't, didn't come easy, and it wasn't overnight either. So, so I, I just continued to set small goals. So I had time goals for cycling, for running, and, and goals, of course, and for balanced eating, and goals around my body mass index, my weight loss. So really began to just look at a few different measures of what a healthy lifestyle is comprised of. Mm -hmm. But then as I became more involved with triathlon, I developed, started to develop triathlon-specific goals too. So I remember three years ago, I just wanted to finish a triathlon without having a heart attack. And really, like, <laughs> pretty sad with <laughs> It's pretty sad when that's your goal, but uh, yeah. I, I still remember checking at that first race to see if they had one of those automatic electronic defibrillators, because um, I was just so concerned I might die during the race. Um, but then, you know, I had some early success, I, then I started to envision, hmm, maybe I could win the provincial points race for the season, and it really just went on from there, and then I'm up to, as you mentioned, uh, qualifying to represent the, the Canadian contingent on the, at the World Championships for age group triathlon. So, um, wow. So so just just back on that point of some of your concerns for that first race, I mean, it, it's interesting that the journey just hits so many different aspects, right? And and one is you had to you had to overcome what was a real fear. I, I mean, yeah, it was not something that was kind of a passing concern. You were you were generally fearful that something could go wrong, and you had to push past that and um, and, and continue. Yeah, so it's yeah, so just like canceling that hiking trip because of the fear of a heart attack, uh, checking on the before I did this race uh, to see if they're going to have a defibrillator nearby. So uh. then, of course, on you know, as it moved to, as I became more involved in triathlon, I began to meet people with similar interests. Mm -hmm. and as a group, we came 
we became accountable to show up on time, to push ourselves, and again to push each other as well to succeed. So it just kind of builds on itself. And I and I want to interject here because uh, one of the reasons I was really excited with this call is that I've known Ron for for a while, and our kids trained on the same uh, triathlon youth team, and we had opportunity to cycle on Birds Hill and do some races together and uh, and it's and, and, and it was really a lot of fun to have a chance to connect with Ron and do the training and push each other so yeah it's uh, it's a great way to kind of mix both relationship building and just having fun together with other people it keeps you motivated Absolutely. Wow now a lot of research um, is growing that that successful changers uh, were able to change um, because they had, you know, a number of different characteristics or qualities, and and one is that they were experimenters. They they, they spent time journaling and reflecting, uh, and almost became social scientists of one, you know, on their own personal journey, and becoming really aware of what worked and what didn't. Um, so as you reflect on your journey, can you relate to any of these characteristics, um, you know, around? Uh, reflection, um, journaling, uh, experimenting, and and if you can, how did it practically apply in your quest for a healthy lifestyle? Well, those are very, very uh, strong statements. Like they really ring true. Like for me, I think this is probably one of the best parts of my transformation. You know, as I moved into the sport of triathlon, um, it really, I really experimented on what worked for me in terms of eating right, planning for recovery time, and determining. What what, what, sorry, what motivates me each day just to get aside, to get to the pool, or even just to moderate my work habits, because it, it's triathlon, yeah, but it's my style overall that, I, that I was, I'm constantly making adjustments to. And also, it's, it wasn't all apple pie and blue sky. Like, there were a lot of little missteps I, I, when I recognized things just weren't working. Mm-hmm. What I learned, though, Sean, was that um, if I just maintained my focus on my larger goals and use each minor setback as an opportunity to improve, that I'm still going to end up where I wanted to go. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's a good point. And I, and I think that um, the, the issue of, of changing, experimenting is critical. So I think sometimes what happens is people have these goals, and they go off the wagon or they don't achieve what they want to achieve and they get frustrated and, and then it creates a spiral that kind of takes them away from the journey. And, and I think what you're saying here is that it's just part of the process. You're going to make progress sometimes. Sometimes you'll maybe not make as much progress, but it's this, this idea that it's an experiment. Everyone's different. I'm sure that you'd say this, that there's no one solution that's going to work for everyone. There's no magic bullet. And you literally are an experiment of one where you have to just keep trying things and find what, what, what works. I know there's some people who are listening to this podcast that there's not a lot of things they like to do in the exercise realm, but there probably is something you know, that they could probably enjoy. And they just have to experiment and just keep trying and find that one thing that, you know what, I kind of enjoy this. This is, this is something I can keep up. Um, fun at it, I think, right? Exactly. It makes it easier. <laughs> I mean, we're all different. It's, it's funny because... Uh, I'm a very solitary um, sports sort of working out person. I, I love nothing more. I, I work in a, in a job where there, I'm always with people. I'm, I'm probably a pseudo extrovert. I have to be extroverted in my work, but uh, I need my alone time. So I really like working out on my own by myself. Um, my wife is completely the opposite. If I, sometimes I'll ask her, how was your workout today? She goes to the workout gym or facility and she says, oh, I kind of felt a little bit lonely. And I, and I wouldn't even... That would even go across my mind. Lonely, but for her, it's a bit of a social experience as well. She's going to meet people, have some conversations. She's part of an environment, and she thrives on that. So we're all we're all very different when it comes to what what motivates us. That's right. Now you had a, a very big goal, and and part of your healthy lifestyle quest involved losing a substantial amount of weight. Um, but it couldn't have been very easy to get. Well, it could have been very easy, I'm sure, to get a little bit overwhelmed about the task that you really were confronting. Um, so although you said that weight loss you know, wasn't the main goal, healthy lifestyle was, obviously losing weight was maybe one of the metrics that you maybe gauged to, to show whether you're in the right, right path. Um, what strategies did you use to consistently work away every day, kind of stay consistent toward the large goal that, that you had before you? Yeah, so it's true. It, uh, like when I had that moment of realization, thinking this needs to end, uh, hmm. I need to figure out what this meant. So, so yeah, so going from an unhealthy lifestyle to a healthy lifestyle just doesn't just happen. When I was at my peak weight there, you know, working long hours, I wasn't completely clear about what I needed to do. Because, uh, like, 
the reality is 100 pounds is a lot of weight. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I did some research and learned about what constitutes a healthy lifestyle. So you mentioned the metrics. So that's why I do is seeing what kind of things do I need to consider. So, like, but a friend of mine always said you can't drive across the country by looking only 12 feet in front of your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need to have the big picture in mind. So, yeah. so I developed my big picture, my, my vision, and then I broke it down into all those manageable parts, all those little metrics I was going to consider. So. My goals then became focused on each component, including like planning for time with family, help, uh, to healthy eating, to time and type of exercise, to, to how much overtime I was working. So I broke each of the pieces into small achievable goals where I could really measure my success. So really the, the chunking down of that huge goal into those little wee pieces was an important part of the journey to, to keep That's you right. focused. Hmm. There was so much wrapped into really like that 100 pounds. It, it, was, just, it was everything. Well, there's a, there's a lot to that, and, and I think that, that that one tip, Ron, I mean, it applies in so many different areas. We all have goals, and, and some of those goals are daunting. They look really, really large and, uh, and daunting, but I think the strategy you talk about, which is just chunking it down to very manageable components, things you can do daily or weekly or quarterly to be on track to those goals, I think that's a, a very a very important principle that we can use in different in other aspects of goal achievement. Right, right. Um, now, when we set new goals, um, you know, often there's the initial excitement and energy that comes from having a, a new goal. I'm, I know I'm like that. I'm a bit of a quick start. I like new ideas and new challenges. And then, um, you know, once the day-to-day -day reality hits, um, uh, it's sometimes uh, challenging to keep that energy going and that positive attitude. And the temptations kind of come into our lives and easily pull us away from our goals. And, and it certainly can be very easy to hit, and it's common to hit plateaus or even fall backwards a little bit in our progress, and, and as a result, lose some emotional steam or energy. Did you have any strategies uh, that you used to keep uh, going even on those days when you just didn't feel like it? Yeah, you know, you mentioned like those days, but those days, yeah, they, they did exist, and they still do exist. Like, there's no, no getting away from it. We all have things that are pulling us away, right? So. Mm. Like the, we've all had those early mornings when it's easier to, easier to stay in bed than to get out when it's cool outside or when there's still warm chocolate cakes in on our kitchen counters and you don't want to grab too much of it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's in these kind of situations. I think back to this interview I read one time between George the General, him Cappy. He's a, an American cycling star. I okay. Mean, cycling, right? I remember that interview where he talked about his work ethic and he said that it's the rainy days that make the difference. And he said that whenever everyone else is huddling from the weather, that those are the days that he pushed himself all the harder. I've never forgotten that piece. It just, and I always think of that during those, really during those rainy days, whether the rain, but just metaphorical rainy days, uh, when things are coming down, I think this is the point I need to keep moving forward. So, like much of my work um, involves helping health organizations to define strategic priorities. Okay goals and activities that help them to achieve their priorities. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a, a French writer who said, oh, um, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So an important component, I think, of moving forward involves being accountable for the activities and for the outcomes. So there will be days that we get sidetracked, and that'll be forever. That we'll always have things pulling us away. When something can derail us from, like, just, I guess, derail the whole process and derail us from moving forward in our goals. But that's the days when we have to refocus to adjust our approach if we need to and then just to keep moving ahead, even if it's in the rain, the way George describes it. So. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, like you say, keeping that momentum going even during the tough times when no one's watching and uh, no one's applauding, no one's cheering you on, and, and that you have that intrinsic motivation yeah. uh, just to keep going. Yeah, very important, very important principle. Um, now, there's no doubt, you know, that our closest relationships can often impact you know, our lifestyle and, and, and goal achievement generally. And in talking with you, I know that your family is just an incredibly important priority for you. So can you share how your, your family played a role in this journey towards a healthy lifestyle? Yeah, actually, yeah, and you're right. My family is very important to me. So, like, my wife and daughter, they're involved in a lot of activities. But I generally still train with or at the same time as my son. Like, it's just the way it's kind of worked out within our family. Um, we... Just, I guess our general interests, we just kind of follow each of our, like she follows my daughter, I follow my son. This still overlaps sometimes, but we just we do recognize it's important as a family goal, just to be supportive of each other's best health. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and 
part of that involves even just family health, like sitting together for at least one meal per day. They're going to do a check-in with everyone to, just to see how we're all doing. So it's all pieces like that. The family is very important that way. You know, we live in a, a, a society that just seems to be pulling at, at us in many different directions, and often it's that connection time with our families that, um, you know, kind of gets lost in this busy shuffle of our lives. Yeah. So yeah, I think you're 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 bang on. If you can you can find time to connect, whether it's for meals or even in activities, recreational activities. Um, you know, whether it's like what you're doing with your son, that's awesome. I mean, to be able to, to, be able to go for a workout, combine your workout, spend time with your kids. Um, to me, that's just. I mean, it's you have a double win there. And um, best of all worlds, right? Yeah, and I see families, you know, that try to integrate whether it's cross country skiing or backpacking or outdoors activities in different kinds. I mean, the more that we can do that, I just there's just no loss to that. I mean, that's just a great, great investment. Um, now, you made triathlon um, a part of this wellness journey. That's come out of our conversation a little bit so far. Um, uh, triathlon actually, is, I don't know how many people uh, listening to this podcast know this, but it's one of the most popular, fastest-growing worldwide sports uh, out there. It's a very, very popular sport, uh, not just at the elite level, but you've got a lot of age group triathletes and new people trying it every year. Um, and one of the challenges of triathlon, and I think it's it's not lost by anyone looking at the sport, is um, it's not just challenging to race triathlons, but it's a real struggle to, to juggle the training. You've got three different sports, actually even more. If you add in strength training and flexibility training and going to the, the physio or the chiro to keep you uh, your body aligned from the training. I mean, it's, there's a lot of juggling. So how did you come to decide to use uh, triathlon as part of your health journey and, and what do you enjoy about the sport? And I guess, do you have any specific goals for this upcoming, upcoming season? Yeah, um, yeah. well, I guess with triathlon, my son started swimming, so I um, was at the pool, but then he switched over from swimming to the, to the provincial youth triathlon team. He had an interest in cycling, too. Uh, running was something fairly new to him, but I think everyone has a, a bit of an ability to run. Yeah. Um, so he, he moved into that and thought, well, since he's out here, why why not me as well? So I kind of just got myself uh, set up on that and actually took my very, very, very first swim lessons in my life. Um, it gets to be about uh, three, two, two and a half years ago or so. Um, and uh, so really learned to swim. So and have developed a little bit since then. So my goals now, though, have been, like, it's, I've qualified to represent Canada at the Triathlon Age Group World Championships in London this year. Um, right now, I'm experiencing an injury to my foot. So I'm not sure, really sure what's exactly going to happen, but I'm still uh, keeping active in whatever ways I can, and I'm looking at some other opportunities, too, in the event that this one doesn't pan out because of my foot injury. Okay, okay. Now, um Ron went by this one tip very quickly, and I want to draw this out, but one of the things he talked about was, uh, actually he didn't share the tip necessarily, but there's a tip here that I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate for the listeners. Uh, he talked about his swimming, and I know firsthand that Ron has uh, done an amazing job. Swimming is a very tough sport, um, technically. It's, it's a hard sport to learn, and when you come into it later in life, it's that much harder. And um, I know firsthand that Ron's just done an amazing job of improving his swimming. I've been swimming in triathlons for, you know, close to 20 years. And um, I, I can I can clearly say that Ron is a faster swimmer than I am. So it's a little bit of a, a ego, ego thing for me. I, I have a tough time keeping up uh, to Ron in the water. But one of the things that Ron did... Yeah, uh, and I think I think this is true. Is is that you not only research, but you actually hired a coach to help you. And I think there's a really important principle in this whole journey, and this is one aspect of it: is the importance of tapping into the expertise of other people, whether it's coaches or trainers or people who've gone through a journey, and that you can tap into that you know that uh, that experience and that technical ability. And I think you're. You know your swimming prowess. The, how much you've improved is a, is a great example. That it's not just in, tr in swimming, but it, it applies to so many other areas of life. Would you agree with that as as an analogy? I, I absolutely do. Yeah. They, um, sometimes we can just do things and spin our wheels. But if we just learn correctly the first time, and then um, do periodic check-ins if we need to, just to kind of stay the focus, to stay on track. Just part of the ongoing. Uh, well, in my work, we call it the plan, do, study, act <laughs> cycle. Okay. Uh, just, to uh, just to kind of keep things focused and to keep improving all, all the time. Wow. So 
as the listeners will realize, there's all these little embedded principles through Ron's story, uh, which is a really inspiring story, but there's also some very practical things we can learn from it. Um, Ron, thank you so much for your willingness to share your story. There, there are a lot of things, like I said, that we can learn from it and some practical tips. Um, and all of us can use that in our quest for a healthier lifestyle and and the achievement of the important goals in our lives, whatever they may be. It might be in our family lives or professional lives, whether it's health or other areas. Um, before we end the interview today, are there any final points or comments that you would like to share? Well, sure, Sonia. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I just want to, again, thank you for the opportunity even to speak here. Um, I, I can think of what, the last thing I'd want to mention is that for a long time, my story was really my personal story. Mm. I didn't really talk about it at all with anybody. And I was initially a little apprehensive about opening myself up in such, in such a public manner. But, you know, a, a local news station found out about the, this weight loss story of mine. And the, they did a story on me, and that story was elevated to be played nationally. And then the response was and continues to be tremendous. Um, people still continue to approach me with their own inspiring and powerful stories about how they have overcome their own obstacles in their lives. And many of them, if not even most of them, majority of them, are well beyond weight loss. Yeah. So it's provided me an opportunity to talk to those individuals and groups about how they, too, can achieve their goals. So mm -hmm. it's really been, a, it's a, I'm learning from them and they're learning from me. So just to be open about it is a, was really a first step for me. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us uh, today, Ron. Really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to do this. And, uh, and um, like I said, on behalf of our listeners, um, we will endeavor to draw out all the little lessons that are embedded in your story so that we can be more successful in the goals uh, or the transitions we're navigating through in our lives. So thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, that's the discussion, the podcast with Ron Oberlin. I really hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation. A lot of great wisdom and practical advice uh, embedded in the discussion that we had today. So I hope you can take it and make practical use of it as you pursue some of the important goals that are in your life. If you'd like more information on Take Charge of Change, uh, we really are about building personal and organizational resiliency, helping organizations to make sure that their staff, employees, and senior executives uh, and personnel are resilient emotionally, cognitively, financially, um, mentally, physically. If you'd like more information on our programs, visit our website at www.hrvchange.com. 